we have a really exciting panel uh, to discuss this morning. Kind of the intersection, I, I think, brought up a bunch of people from LA, a bunch of people from New York, but to really talk about the intersection of tech and entertainment, um, which over, I would say, the past couple of years have really taken off and sort of in, in a new, awesome direction. Um, and we'll go through and sort of introduce everyone and talk about what they're up to and, uh, and, and take, it, take it from there. And obviously, we'll open it up for, for some questions. Um, Steve, let's, let's start with you and, and talk about Big Frame. You call it a next generation media company. Um, tell us a little bit about Big Frame, but, but also tell us what a next generation media company looks like. Okay, yeah, I can, I can start there. I mean, what we mean by a media company really is, is that we're not creating software to sell to media companies. We're not trying to um, make money as a management company. We're trying to be a media company, and that, that's a company that creates content, brings audiences and content creators together, packages that all together, and then finds a way to make money, either by selling it to advertisers or e-commerce or, or so, some other way. And so it's kind of an uncommon... Um, model to get financed. Venture capitalists don't tend to, you know, invest in that. And so we're, we've got, you know, we have, we have found some that are open-minded on that model, but really we're a lot more working, working on the model that uh, we saw uh, produce lots of humongous companies. The last time there was a major uh, video distribution uh, disruption, which was when cable happened. And so we're, re we're really saying, how do we use the dynamics of this online video market, which is YouTube meets social meets all kinds of different formats, and, and how is that going to define the next big brands like cable to find MTV and TNT and ESPN, and so. And just and talk about YouTube for, for a second. Just talk about kind of how that, what it's done for disruption and what it's done for, for your business as well. Well, I mean, yeah, the, YouTube gets a lot of sort of, uh, a lot of people shooting arrows at it uh, because it's, it's so big and powerful, but I mean, you have to remember that it, it allows anybody anywhere in the world to upload content, have it be accessible on any device in almost any country immediately, right? So thanks, you know, that was pretty, pretty, pretty good job there, engineering-wise, that, that worked out well, and you get, you get to make money from it. And so um, the, the, the thing that YouTube is going through right now, I think, is, is that there, there's tension inside, as there are at most big companies, between well, we're a monopoly, should we just sort of act as a platform or should we go for the next, the next step of, of sort of dominating and really make it a place for premium content to survive? And I think that that's kind of where the fight is going on right now. They spent a lot of money um, very publicly a year ago funding all this premium content and they forgot to market it. Um, and so it didn't work that well. Uh, and uh, they also didn't know how to sell it. So, you know, it, everybody made all this content, nobody saw it, and, and no advertisers uh, got to use it. And so that was, that was a miss. And so we're all looking at them now saying, well, just, you know, don't stop. Like, you, you know, we have to keep learning and, and keep trying. And so what Big Frame is really focused on is, well, independent of, of YouTube and what they're going to do in terms of grants, what does a sustainable online video media company look like? And so. We, we look at the data, we work with hundreds of content creators, we're trying to find a way to help them make a living, but we're also trying to find a way so that basically we can acquire customers for cheaper than that we can monetize them for. And we're looking at all kinds of... Um, is it, and is it working? Yeah, I mean, it, 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 it's, it's right there on the edge, right? Just like most, most startup companies are, where, where every, every month our revenue goes up, we're, we're, we're looking at our margins and our costs. Uh, we're following lots of different models that we're seeing having worked in pure play. Like we look a lot at Vice and what they've done. We look a lot at Buzz, uh, BuzzFeed and the, you know, those kinds of content companies, uh, successful blog companies. Like how do digital only companies manage their costs, organize their company, work with advertisers, develop brands, do all of those things. And, and for us, the, just the difference is all of our content is, is video and all of it is <coughs> online video, which means it's snackable, shareable, searchable. It, it, it meets all of those criteria. All right, that's a lot, lot more to talk about. Mark, um, you're the co-founder of uh, Tongle, um, which crowdsources videos for big brands. What, is, what does that mean? Tell, tell us a little bit more about what you, what you do. Yeah, first off, I'm, I'm not Zach Braff, and I apologize, but... Uh, Are um, we Braffless? <laughs> yeah, I saw him there. I don't know where he's... But uh, Elijah. 
sitting over there. <laughs> we actually, I, I came, we came out of Hollywood. So I'd, I'd worked for Warner Brothers. I worked for a talent agency. Initially, a lot of our business was born more out of frustration than anything. Um, so, you know, our goal in, in building Tongle was to build a meritocracy for talent. So, we, the biggest need out there um, was coming from brands. It also helped that they were willing to pay for it. So, we've now built a community of 50,000 filmmakers, writers, ideators. You know, we always said the mom from Iowa may have a great idea or may want to engage with a brand. She may not have the core skill set to bring um, that idea to life via video. So let's allow her to collaborate with a community of filmmakers, um, a lot of whom specifically in Los Angeles were waiting to be anointed um, in some cases. So we said if we can build a platform where they can, you know, prove their worth, uh, it will give them opportunity and choice, choice, and will also reward them for that. So, and it's yeah, it's been a pretty good run. We've obviously with um, we've worked with P and G, Lego, Mattel, Colgate, Pepsi, you name it. Well, so talk about yeah. so so you made a your community, I guess, made a, an ad for the Super Bowl for seventeen dollars, right? Talk about amazing margin. Seventeen thousand. Oh, seventeen thousand yeah. dollars. <laughs> so, sorry, sorry. Which is which is still not enough. Liz, you know, where were my zeros on this? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, uh, we, we, it's it's funny, we'd actually done a, a, a series, we probably did about 30 programs for Colgate working with, uh, with YNR, their agency. Um, it wasn't intended for the Super Bowl, and I think, you know, you hear it every day, whatever the term du jour is, whether it's native advertising or authentic uh, advertising, emotional storytelling, um, you know, they had 30 pieces of content they'd produce. They were thinking about what to run um, on the Super Bowl. There was one that stood out, it was one that we had produced, and. I think that's happened a lot, you know, very often as of late. A lot of our content has percolated up, and I think it's a result of you know, not being diluted by having too many chefs in the kitchen. Um, there's a lot of sort of freedom in what we do within the platform where we just, there's timelines, there's not a six to nine month process. A lot of the content we'll produce happens in four to six weeks. Um, so it stood out for YNR, they ran on the Super Bowl, and it made that guy's career. So beyond the 17,000, he's now not only earned a lot on Tongle, but he's gone on to become a professional commercial. What was the commercial? Uh, it was for Speed Stick, yeah, which I actually saw running yesterday, so he's still getting residuals. So, and, and, obviously, <laughs> and obviously YouTube ads are, you know, now, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, Super Bowl ads are, are $4 million, I think it was just announced, right, for th sort of 30 second spots, so brands are obviously still going to the traditional places where all the eyeballs are, and they're also trying to figure out now what to do on YouTube, and, and have you noticed sort of how they're navigating those? I know from our end, they're just starting to figure it out. I mean, I, I think, and the, these guys know better than I do, I think for a long time, I've probably been preaching the value of content and owning a conversation and, you know, taking the guardrails off, allowing it to just be fluid storytelling. I feel like they've, there's been these massive content audits by a lot of these companies, and they're now just finally realizing that, you know, Google has all of these bells and whistles to justify the content, so let's start creating it at scale continuously, which is nice to see. Steven, let's talk about Slated, which is your company. You call it um, an angel list for film funding. Tell us, tell us a little bit about what, uh, what you're working on. Uh, well, first off, how many people here have heard of angel list? Can I get a show of hands? All right, there's a small percentage. Um, uh, Slated is an online matchmaking service, essentially. So if you, if you look at the whole umbrella term of crowdfunding, uh, under there, it includes everything from impulse donations on Indiegogo Kickstarter to AngelList, uh, Second Market, Slated, which is professional equity investing uh, in different asset classes. So Slated is more on that end of the spectrum. Uh, but the idea was that uh, over the years, looking at where is the disruption really occurring in Hollywood or with content in general, uh, everybody started looking at um, distribution, You've got a film made, where can I get it shown? Where can I get it shown in an on online platform? How do I monetize that? How do I match it with advertising? There was a massive amount of competition, and so when everybody was heading in that direction, we decided to go in a different direction, which was, well, how do you get that stuff made to begin with? And the number one challenge all content makers have is getting their films financed. So that was the toughest nut to crack because fil film finance, for anybody who's participated in it, in it is, is one of the most wild and woolly worlds and you really need to have been in the business to see how dysfunctional and inefficient it is. But not so long in the business that you become completely cynical and jaded and you want to give up. So we tried to come in right at a moment uh, where 
everybody was looking for help in 2008 after the market collapsed and a lot of money was taken out of independent film financing and studios shut down their specialty divisions and were doing only bigger and bigger budget films. And crowdfunding on one end uh, is really for the sort of the $50 impulse donation. We decided to come into the middle and help out the independent fil feature filmmakers who are making the one to $20 million budget films. And those are the films that are most often getting the Oscar nominations. That's what most audiences love and really connect with. But that's where all the money had disappeared. So Slated came in and created simply a matchmaking service between investors, filmmakers, and the industry. So it's much more easy now, if you will, to sort of browse around Hollywood, identify projects you might like, be matched to it automatically, almost like a dating service, so you can much more efficiently get to the projects you might really like, get to know those filmmakers, and go and invest in those And it's, it's accredited investors? Yeah, so Slated is only for professional investors. Uh, it's a members-only community, so you need to be invited in, or you need to know two people who will vouch for you to come in. We're catering primarily to uh, sort of the top few thousand producers, directors, distributors, financiers in the world to try and maintain quality. So we are heavily curating, but we've already attracted about two and a half billion dollars in uh, capital representation on the platform. We've got about 200 features on the platform. The first 20 features have completed financing and they've gone on to all the major festivals and have sold. One of the first films that we landed on our platform which unfortunately our investors didn't get to get into, but it was still on our platform, was The Way, Way Back, which got released uh, this summer. There's another film called Roman Polanski, Odd Man Out, um, which is getting released uh, in October, and there's just a slew of films now that are Four filming. films in, in Toronto in the, we, the next Yeah, year. I mean, well, I, there's, there's so many that I lose track. We, we had about six films at Sundance and another half dozen at Tri Tribeca, and eventually I started losing count which ones are going where, but they're all getting in and selling, which so, is the most important. So let me, let me ask you two follow-up questions to that. One is, talk a little bit, and, and for people who don't know, um, a little bit about the Jobs Act, and how has that changed this business? It, it's sort of very new, and I think people are still trying to figure it out, but and how does that sort of affect the business about, of what you're doing? So the Jobs Act hasn't changed anything. We all hope it will. And when it was passed or signed into law a year and a half or... A, do, you wanna, do you want to just describe it? for? So the, the Jobs Act, sorry, is really to help... Um, legalize the process of crowdfunding. So that, it used to be that you were limited to how many investors you could reach out to, they had to be people you had an existing relationship with. All of these protections were put in, God, 70 years ago, 100 years ago, I don't even remember, to protect small mom and pop investors from being duped by some nefarious Wall Street firm. Now, obviously that still happens. Uh, but the process of uh, raising money now has completely changed you no longer just go to your aunt and uncle and a few friends, you now go to your social network and it's way easier to go raise small amounts of money. And we've seen the huge successes. You know, if Zach Braff was here, he'd be telling us all about the few million dollars he raised on Kickstarter. So the Jobs Act is designed to make that legal. Uh, but there are limitations there. You can only raise up to a million dollars. You can only have so many unaccredited investors or unsophisticated investors. They can only invest up to $10,000 or 10% of their income. There is all sorts of auditing requirements that come into play. So all of a sudden, the Jobs Act looking a little bit complicated. Uh, so the time it'll take to roll these things out and uncomplicate the things the SEC has recomplicated, who knows how this is going to play out. So in the interim, uh, companies like Slated have just decided to go ahead and register and become a broker-dealer, which is that daunting, horrendous task where you have to study and I'll get all these series exams passed. We just decided to bite the bullet so that we can do everything legally uh, without being limited by the potential eventual Jobs Act. Do you, do you think there's a danger in sort of democratizing investing in films? I mean, you obviously, you have a huge sort of educational component to your, to your site as well. You know, it's, it's as if, if everybody all of a sudden can write a check, do you think that sort of muddies the process a little bit or are you, are you excited about that? Well, overall, you're letting anyone who actually is interested in something to finally participate. So I think that's good for everybody. But, ev it's, but it's an investment, right? I mean, you, you give them returns on there. Yes. I mean, instead, instead of literally giving $10,000 to Spike Lee so you can watch a basketball game with him, you now can actually own a piece of the upside of his next film, maybe. So the idea is, is people will donate, but only up to so much. You know, an impulse donation of 50 bucks, easy. For some people, an impulse donation of 5,000 bucks, easy. But eventually you get to a point where you want to own a piece of the upside. 
Um, you know, everybody here has probably donated something small. I, it, how many people here have actually given some sort of small donation to a friend's project on any crowdfunding platform? Okay, a lot. Uh, how many of you have invested in something and it was more than what you donated? A one, two, one person? You mean on Kickstarter? How many people have just invested into anything, like actual owned equity or... Stocks? Okay, so a smaller number of you, but, but more than you donated, perhaps. So, you know, when you look at the numbers, there's a massive market of people willing to invest in stuff and a smaller market of people willing to give. So the idea is, is we want to unlock that potential. Now, with that, you have to get educated along the way. The idea is not just to go blow money one time and realize it was a terrible investment and never do it again. It's, you got to learn to ride the bicycle properly first before you start, you know, getting into some sort of a, a rally. So we, ha we are helping educate less sophisticated investors. We're pairing them up with more sophisticated investors on Slated. So people are gradually learning. I think it's going to be a 10 to 20 year process of growing into sort of the comfort zone of investing. And did it, my last question, then we'll, well um, when they invest, do they have a say in sort of the film? I, I think if, if Elijah or Zach Braff were sitting here, he would say that part of the reason why he went to Kickstarter was because he wanted total control of the film himself. And, and um, you know, of, of the decisions and so forth that would, that would be made from it. Do your investors get to pick the location because it's cheaper, where they're gonna shoot, or the sound, you know, because it's cheaper, et cetera? Do, do they have a say in it, artistic say? So, uh, the, the short answer is it's entirely up to the filmmaker. Okay. So the power of these platforms is that it takes the power away from a Harvey Weinstein and it puts it more into the hands of Quentin Tarantino. You're putting the power back into his hands. Now Quentin can decide, I want to give 10,000 basketball courtside seats away to my fans. Or he could decide, I want to let that one person who gave me a $10 million check uh, ha, you know, be in the film. So it's up to Quentin. The power goes back into his hands. So that's really totally up to the filmmakers. We're just there to you know, bring you introductions and then you can do with it whatever you want. December. Five years before the Facebook.com would launch. That's true. And five years before YouTube would launch. Yeah. So you're the oldest person on this panel. For, like, for right? sure. When it, when it comes sure. to this. Well, we'll get to your history in a minute. But... Um, but, but tell us, how have you seen, how has college humor changed? How have you seen this entire space change? I mean, it's, 10 sure. years ago was, you know, huge. Yeah, so when we first started college humor, we were basically one of the only user-generated content sites on the web, and that was still a unique idea. I mean... Yeah, how, how'd you come up with that so idea? So it was my uh, best friend from high school and I went to different colleges, and his brother worked for a company uh, that was at the time called Technosurf. It later was renamed Advertising.com. And his brother one day was like, hey guys, if you, you know, there's this thing you can do if you can get a, people to a website, you can put ads on it, and it's like a newspaper, and then you can make money. And so uh, my friend and I were like, let's start a website. And we basically took photos and videos that our friends would take and put them on, on a site, and then other people from other colleges started contributing. So that's how it became this user-generated site. And, uh, and it was, you know, it's very novel at the time. There's no other platform for people to upload their own stuff. Um, so that was kind of the genesis of it. And, and so how have you seen sort of the whole shift change and how are you adapting to that? Yeah, shift? so, I mean, I think there's I mean, a lot of factors. So we started, uh, we also started Vimeo in 2004, 2005. Uh, and that was, you know, Vimeo and YouTube came out around the same time. And, that's really been the big shift of, it doesn't, you, you no longer need a curator, everybody's a curator. And, um, and that's certainly shifted things. Uh, it's, I've seen our brand expand into, we, we've done uh, books and TV shows and we just did our first movie. You know, really taking things off, you know, out of that core, um, that core web property, but always keeping the web property active because that's where the audience comes back to every day. And if you don't have a relationship with your audience every day, you're going to lose them. And when we first started out, we looked at the history of the National Lampoon. And we saw that, you know, they had their, uh, their magazine, and then they had uh, their breakthrough movie, and they were on the right track, but their magazine went from monthly to bi-monthly to quarterly to yearly. 
and they weren't in the face of their fan very frequently, and they kind of lost them. And it, being a National Lampoon fan didn't mean as much when it was just a movie every few years. How have you, and how has the site also adapted to mobile? What, what percentage of, of your it's, videos and so forth are watched It's approaching on 50%. And it's, I was talking to our editor-in-chief the other day, and I was like, when our writers write, we should, we should write, not write it on the phone, but when we view a piece, view it on the phone instead of viewing it on the desktop, because that's what, that's what most people are going to see it. And you know, if you're, if and you're, so have, so have you adapted? Have you have you shot in closer? Or have, have there been sort of? We've been making different. So we so most of our sketches that we've done for the past ten years are three minute, four minute sketches, and that's what we've become known for, and that's something we, we pioneered. And now we look at that and we say, okay, well, if we're on set shooting a sketch that's going to end up at four minutes, let's see what ten second clip we can get. You net that. Now that we have those actors and we have this stage and we've rented these props, what can we do that's, that's very, very small? And then we'll post that to our Instagram or we'll post it to our Facebook or something like that. And smaller stuff tends to get shared even more frequently. Um, Steve, Big Frame runs Bam, Bamo, right? Which is a YouTube channel, which you mentioned was also part of the, got funding from YouTube when YouTube decided to give over a hundred million dollars of sort of original content to different people. Mm -hmm. um, talk to us a little bit about how that channel has been going and sort of, do you think that what YouTube did by giving content creators money to create content on YouTube, was that a success? Now with, with a little bit of hindsight With a little bit it. of hindsight. Well, I mean, I think from YouTube's standpoint, it was a success because it got everybody talking about YouTube and it got everybody's focus a little bit turned over there. And, how do I get money, who got money, like all of that stuff, and, and they got into the press, and I think at the, at the time when their numbers were just going like this, it was, it, it was basically good marketing for YouTube. Um, the program itself, I mean, we actually got a second round of funding, but very few companies did, and it was, like I said before, they, where they really st let, let down, everybody just assumed, well, they're gonna spend a hundred and something million dollars on content creation, there's going to be some marketing that's going to come behind it, and they just literally had none. They were just like, upload it and collaborate with each other and, and stuff like that. And so that left a really bad taste in everybody's mouth because it was a lot of work and people put time into it, and you know they didn't, they didn't have any chance of ever recouping the money, and only very few of us ever got to where we were getting tens of thousands even of views on, on a video. Um, so, so knowing what you know now, would you have done it again? I would have done it totally differently again, um, which, so is what, what we're what our, <laughs> which is what we're doing with our second round of financing. So we're, uh, w with our second round of financing, uh, we, we gave them sort of what they were asking for. They gave us the money, and, and then we said, well, we're not doing that. You know, we're not doing the same thing again. That's right. So, so specifically, though, yeah. what would you have changed? So basically what, I ch what we changed is, uh, for one, um, <clears throat> Our strategy at the beginning was to, was to work with our community of big YouTubers to create a channel. Uh, we didn't do a really good job of, thinking of, of, think, of looking at the data and making sure that their audiences were homogeneous, right? So the, the power of, of creating a network, any kind of network, is, is that you're hopefully showing them little beats, bits and pieces of content that all fit together and, and, and where you can grow an audience like College Humor has. You know what you expect when, when you go to College Humor. And because you go there, when they show you something new that you've never seen before, you're more likely to sort of watch it. And so our first attempt, we, we mixed artists that were sort of wrong for one another, and, and so we didn't get the marketing benefit. And so now basically what we're doing is we're investing it in even actually uh, less expensive content, but we're, we're holding back more than half of the money to do marketing against the content. So, so it seems like, and jump in, but it, it seems like cutting through the clutter, right? That's, that's what everyone's dying to do, and, and that's yeah. what, you know, especially now that there's all this other content, you know, original content and so forth, it's just like, get me through this clutter so people will see Yeah, I think he's it. dead on. I mean, there, we have one main College Humor channel, and it's one of, the, one of the biggest on YouTube, but we're starting to peel off individual shows from that channel because... When people subscribe to a YouTube channel, they're subscribing, they want to subscribe to a show and not a network, if you think of it you know, in, the, in TV terms. And so if you just have a bunch of kind of incongruous things in, in, that, in, in what they're subscribing to, you'll see a lot of unsubscribes when you post something that, that doesn't fit. And I mean, I think 
I'll add this to the oh, question. We had people fighting with, the, with each other in the comments. This sucks. I want more of that. And it's like, oh, that was a mistake. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's just. So, and, and I'll add to the question about the, the YouTube, first YouTube round of funding and whether it worked or not. I, I think one of the problems was they gave money to a lot of people who are used to making content that talks at people, but not to people. And, and I think if you know, if you, and they also, they, I don't know if you guys were like this, but you got, cr you got credited per minute of content you made, which is just kind of a crazy, I mean, YouTube knows that that's not a great way to do it, but for some reason, like, you, you're rewarded by putting a 20 minute video on YouTube, just, yeah. just doesn't work. Yeah. And you need to apply an algorithm to it. Yeah, not, I, uh, not to mention they give money to some of the celebrities, like, you know, Ellen, not to knock on Ellen DeGeneres, but Ellen DeGeneres has a talk, a daily talk show. I think she wants to keep the daily talk show, not move to just making content continuously for YouTube. So it always seemed like a short-lived play. We have, we have, we have 10 minutes and, um, and there's, there's so much to discuss, but the underlying sort of theme, I think, of this panel, or, or a lot of why this panel has come together, right, is because technology is trying to disrupt, for lack of a better word, Hollywood, the entertainment industry. Um, this weekend, we got sort of a roundup of the summer and, and what the summer did on the box office. And, and sort of quoting the New York Times, North America for this summer total, totaled $4.71 billion in box office, right, which was a 10.2% increase over the same period as last year. Um, attendance rose in the box uh, the theater 6.6% to about 573 million people. Okay, these numbers are huge, and it would seem Hollywood's doing pretty well, right? What do you each sort of think is the one thing that is really missing in Hollywood and what needs to be disruptive? Or disrupted. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, seconds. Th th those stats, you can always kind of move those numbers around to make it sound good, and Variety has done that for a long time. Um, but if I was quoting the New York Times, but, you know, oh, they're always right. Oh, we Come always on, they're, they're always questioning right. the New York Times. <laughs> Them in details. What does Graf think? <laughs> Um, a lot of that, I think, is now foreign demand, right? So there's no, those were those were American numbers. Okay. Yeah. 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 Pro profitability, I would I would always question, and you know, studio accounting uh, better than I do. It's not always as transparent as slated. So I I wonder. I, it seems to me like they're making less movies, and they're obviously uh, they're they're not paying attention to sort of the adult dramas that are out there because other people are figuring out how to make those movies for niche audiences. Um, so I don't. I mean. I, I don't that, know that, but that's, a, that's not a small detail. That's the most critical figure that wasn't quoted. How much did it cost them to make those movies and market those movies? Because everyone in Hollywood knows that the cracks are showing. And this sounds a lot like uh, 1999 when advertising in newspapers was at an all-time high and they were laughing at all the, the notion that the internet was destroying newspapers. And we all know what happened in the next decade. So. That this is sort of the last big stretch as they try to completely retool, and they're going to have to retool. Now, the question is, is it going to be a nice, gentle, soft transition, or is it going to be a really hard fall? Because for the moment, the end of that long tail is just growing and growing. Donations side keep growing. What we're doing is going to keep growing, and they can either keep ignoring that until it's too late, or gradually take a cue from that and come up with more efficient ways of making the films and, get, and appealing more to niche audiences. Do you think Kickstarter and, and the way of financing films through Kickstarter, we obviously saw two very huge successes, one in Veronica Mars, one in Zach Braff's film, is here to stay and will continue to be sort of a force years to come? Yes, uh, most people who haven't been in the film industry probably don't realize, but soft money, which is basically money you don't have to recoup, uh, has always existed. Now, it's come from larger foundations, it's come from tax breaks, government subsidies. Instead of you giving your tax money to a government and a government writing a check, you give directly to it now. So I can be super targeted and give it to one movie I love or a bunch of different things, but it's no longer through a different entity. So it's just a more personal engagement. But the more you raise through donations, the more appealing it gets to investors because that's non-recoupable. So Zach Braff, raised $3 million for his film. It's a $5 million budget film, $2 million coming from investors. So investors are putting in two and getting five in value. So you can get away with that for a while before donors eventually say, hey, uh, we want to get a piece of the upside. But the point is, is there, there's a new balance taking place between what investors want and donors want, and that's fantastic for the industry. And, and I think and another part that we've all mentioned, and I want to talk to you, Ricky, about this, is marketing a film, right? You can make a film for 
call it $20 million, and then you yep. market it for $100 million, yeah. and then you have to recoup $120 million if before you even break even. You've marketed a film, your first film, and barely spent, you spent $60,000 on marketing, right? Yeah. You spent nothing. I mean, the, the test, so we released our first movie about a month and a half ago. It's called Coffee Town, and uh, we shot it for you know, a couple million bucks, which is nothing in the world of big budget features, and we marketed it for nothing. The reason we were able to market it is because we have a platform which we could use. We have, you know, 20 million monthly readers who read our site, and, and we can put it on there. We have one of the biggest YouTube channels, so when we put our trailer in the YouTube channel, it instantly had half a million views instead of, you know, somebody starting from scratch, putting it on YouTube, and just trying to get the word out. So I really think there's going to be uh, people who have promotional platforms will start taking advantage of that and start promoting their own stuff instead of other people's stuff. I mean, when we started College Humor, we didn't know any advertisers, so we started a t-shirt company so we could become our own advertiser. And I think that's gonna happen a lot more with people as they're like, well, I have a big megaphone, what can I shout? Yeah, I mean, I think that these guys... Let's, the, oh, sorry, I'm yeah, just, let's, sure. does anyone have any questions in the audience? Sir, do we have a mic for him? Hi, you just uh, spoke about the classic case of low-end uh, disruption with um, big studios not realizing what is happening with uh, sort of film financing. But how do you then reconcile distribution and marketing, right? Are you gonna be distributing on, on YouTube channels for these uh, full-length movies? Or is there, in the plans, a way to reach the consumer and market the movie to the consumer without being in big theaters? Well, if, if, if you embrace the collective, right, the plumbing is there on distribution, you can now almost collateralize the demand, right? So if a million people are investing in a movie, all of a sudden you have a million advocates to help market your movie. So I think you can really start to provide economies of scale there. Yeah, I mean, we, for Coffee Town, we went... Every, we were able to get on every cable uh, provider for VOD, Amazon, yeah. iTunes, Voodoo, I mean, literally Xbox, anywhere you wanted it, it was same day. And there are companies now that can just do that for you. There's a, there's a particular example I'd like to use called uh, Margin Call. So I don't know if everybody saw that movie or heard about that movie, but that movie was made for three and a half million dollars. Uh, it was released simultaneously on iTunes and in theaters. The theater was viewed purely as a loss leader. Uh, so it's, it was its marketing event, and it made the vast majority of its money through iTunes because of it, it took advantage of all the publicity that was happening right there and then with a the simultaneous release. So filmmakers are beginning to realize that distribution, you, you need new types of distributors thinking differently about the most effective way to find an audience. Okay, margin call, it's about high finance and the financial crisis, that's gonna appeal really to a much more narrow audience of bankers and banker haters. And uh, how do we get to them? And can we get on a platform where we can efficiently market it and take advantage of all the PR we're getting and not have to spend 30 million? Because by the way, that's the minimum a studio yeah. you know, wants to spend on marketing for any film. So that's why they have to make big films. When, when we're making, and, and I'm, I'm an agent, and so I look at this carefully, when you're making casting decisions, will a actor's social media presence now fit into that? Will you have to pay that actor more? I would hope so. But, you know, and, and so if forth it, in, in building out that film. If yeah. it's for a digital film, absolutely. I'd say not as much if it's like, I mean, Fifty Shades of Grey, like, that's a big movie. People are going to see that no matter who's in it. But for us, with... with Raph is auditioning right now. <laughs> but with... Uh, <laughs> with uh, uh, too, too soon, too soon. <laughs> so with our movie, we were able to go to individual people, so we have stars from in our movie, Always Sunny, Friday Night Lights, Parks and Rec, Eastbound and Down, and we also have had Josh Groban, the singer. And so we were able to go to all of those, fans of all of those TV shows and market directly to them and customize the ads based on who we were marketing to. So if you're a fan of Parks and Rec, we would put Ben Schwartz in the thumbnail of the trailer and have it play automatically on your Facebook page. And the biggest surprise to me was how big Josh Groban's fan base is. And it is, uh, it was like this hidden gem where we were like, oh my God, this guy has millions and millions of fans across the globe. We can market directly to them and they will go nuts and reblog it and all that stuff. And, uh, and so it, it, it matters if it's a, if you're, the marketing depends on uh, 
social talk. Let me let me ask just sort of one final question. There's been a lot of buzz recently about the new CEO of Yahoo, how she be, how she beat out sort of the the interim CEO because he wanted to become a content. He wanted Yahoo to become a content company, and she wanted Yahoo to become a tech company. When you, as CEOs, as founders of your companies, are you trying to compete with the Warner Brothers and the Disney's of the world to become a content company, or are you trying to compete with the Facebooks and Googles of the world to become a tech company? Well, for me, it's uh, yeah, we're we're trying to become a content company, and we're trying to do it by being by taking advantage of all of these tools that are being built. I mean, one thing that's awesome for companies, any kind of content content company right now is, is that venture capital does want to invest in platform companies. And so as you're running a media business now, basically your phone never stops ringing from some startup that just got $5 million and is building a widget to do X. And it's been uncanny how we've been running our business and, and, and getting to the point where like we, you know, we're whiteboarding something and we need this and within a week somebody's called us and then we find out there's three companies and they want to give it to us So you want, you want to be a content company because you can sort of buy or acquire or somehow the, the tech of it. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I, we've just seen that access to data and access to better analytics, access to more efficient ways of doing things makes, makes great companies and oh. makes, makes better media super, super quickly, 20 seconds. Yeah, I mean... You want to be both. I mean, Netflix yeah, 20 seconds is both. Go both. Ahead. It's a false choice. I think there's so much area and white space in between. And just to plug for Ricky and, and College Humor, the startup guy sort of encapsulates that whole startup scene and the absurdity of it. But it's both sides don't necessarily, they're not very introspective or see the other side. It's always a balance between art and science. There's so much opportunity in between. Final thought? Yeah, that makes sense. All right, great. <laughs> Thank you very much.